from the Catholic underground. Today on the show, in Russia, Olympic Watch U. New studies on the psychology of teens, parishes, online stuff, flash mobs at mass, maybe again. Our picks of the week and so much more. The Catholic Underground starts right now. Alrighty, welcome to the Catholic Underground. It is your weekly Catholic guide to the digital continent. It is episode number 256. I'm Father Chris Decker, your moderator. If you're listening live, you can join us at catholicunderground.tv and get your chat on. Special welcome to all of you who are joining us on catholicunderground.tv and our YouTube live channel. Joining me this week in video, we've got Father Ryan Humphreys. He's rector of the Minor Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in historic Natchitoches, Louisiana. Hello, Father. Hello, world. We've also got Kathleen Lee. She is a teacher at St. Joseph's Academy in Baton Rouge, and she's our semi-pro faith ninja. She's right here. Hello, Kathleen. Hello, and here I am. That's right. We've also got Jeff Blackwell. He's the technical director of the CU. Yes. Hello, Jeff. <laughs> Howdy ho, neighbor. And Mary-Kate Taylor is our video director for the live stream. You may not see her face, but you see her handiwork if you're watching us on CatholicUnderground.tv. Something else happening on TV uh, these next few weeks, the Olympics. Ah, yes. And NBC is officially the <laughs> not broadcasting anything company. Um, so, Father Ryan, you're a big Olympic guy. You actually don't have broadcast television in your house. Right. I've, I haven't had it for probably about the last five years, maybe six now. And, uh, and that's never, ever a problem except when the Olympics come around. Right. Everything else I'm completely able to watch online. But the Olympics, unless you have a subscription to cable television, you can't use the fairly terrible app that not broadcasting anything company has uh, – <laughs> you know, has, has made for us. It's extremely frustrating, Father. Yeah, I, I, I just don't get this. It seems like every time the Olympics comes around, whether it's the summer games or the winter ones, we, we always run into this. And, and NBC um, owns not just NBC broadcast television, but they own something like five cable networks in addition to that. And uh, I know usually for the summer games, they, they convert, and you've probably seen this, Kathleen, they convert all of their cable networks into Olympic channels. Yep. Mm-hmm. They also buy time on, uh, on some digital channels on most cable companies, and they show even more. And I just, I, I don't get why we're not showing all these feeds. But it seems, uh, Father, you've done a little reading on this. It seems that part of this is coming from the Olympic Committee themselves. Yeah, the IOC is is extremely basically caught in the Stone Age with technology because their big priority is making the Olympics break even financially, which, you know, makes sense. It's an extremely expensive thing to do. But and so they they are very, very specific. Every country gets one broadcaster who pays a small fortune for the rights. And then that broadcaster tries to recoup their extreme expense. Um, by making sure that nobody else can enjoy anything except on their network. Yeah. And when you have a fairly narrow-minded network, everything falls apart. And so what I'm doing now is using a series of technologies to watch most of my stuff through Canada. Huh. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I don't know how uh, CTV's coverage is um, uh, compared to NBC, but uh, I, I would actually... CTV in Canada... Um, takes up the the second largest footprint in the International Broadcasting Center uh, in Sochi. It's, it's awesome. I yeah. mean, they're, they're, they've got a steady stream of, of of data, a steady stream of information on the in the lower thirds. They do a lot of breakout boxes. They don't spoil anything. Ooh. Um, and and they're running, uh, you know, because CTV quite, has quite a lot of channels. They can reallocate. Uh, everything is running. I mean, it's you know, th- there's some stuff if you want to watch the women's qualifying of the moguls second round. You, you're going to need to go somewhere else. But, I mean, for, for all the major events, um, even even biathlon, men's 5,000-meter biathlon, there was a great coverage. And while that seems wildly boring, of course, the Canadians, you know, they're, they're special. And they get the the coolness of the whole thing. Yeah, they like uh, these their, long And their commentary form. is, it comes from a place, because the Canadians have a sense of winter that most American commentators just don't have. True. That's very true. Now, what's also interesting is is in the midst of all of this stuff with copyright and we'll let you broadcast this, but not that, and uh, maybe we're just choosing not to broadcast this or that, the social networking stuff in Sochi is is actually a, a breakthrough for the Olympic Committee, right? Yeah. they In the past, they've not allowed Olympians to tweet. They've not allowed Olympians to take photographs and send them anywhere without them being copyrighted. Um, and this time, basically, they just they lost. The Olympians are doing whatever they want to do. 
Yeah, uh, and and that's to me that is that should be a, a, a sign that that something's going on here. Mm-hmm. Um, Jeff, you're you've you've actually done uh, some work with um, with the sports broadcasting in right. the United States, and I would imagine that uh, that in your work there, uh, the more feeds, the better, right? Yeah, and in fact, uh, at the '96 Olympics in um, Atlanta. Mm-hmm. I, I was working for the uh, uh, for a, a company that did the the U.S. Olympic trials, which was like 30 days before the Olympics were broadcast. However, we sat side by side with the NBC digital truck. It was the first time they rolled that out. And then Father Ryan, you might get a kick out of this too, uh, as well, Father Chris. But the, their slow mo machines were they were using laser discs at that time. Ooh. <laughs> but, they uh, need a whole nother truck just for that. <laughs> it was a an enormous truck. They had. Um, they had so much audio. I forgot uh, how many it was. It was close, approaching a hundred channels of audio. Oof. And th- this is for the track and field um, uh, uh, work. Uh, but I was on the truck that I was taking all of the um, the sound effects from the NBC guys, and then I was on what they call the World Feed truck. We were feeding sound effects, and actually, we were. Uh, it was only a two channel uh, setup um, as far as our output because we were doing British Sky on one channel. And then on the other channel, we were just feeding the the effects feed. Uh, we were feeding French, uh, Chinese, I forgot how many uh, other um, networks. But we were just sending them the sound. They had their own announcers. So it was a pretty big deal. And, yes, you want multiple feeds. You want backups to backups because uh, and it, it always takes up so much real estate because you have mm-hmm. stuff happening all over the place. And it happens simultaneously. So you have to be recording and play it back later, what have you. So it's a, it's a big deal. My goodness, to say nothing of uh, of what the actual end user, what the viewer sees, too. And I can only imagine it's got to be hard to say, well, we're going to air this and not that. But I guess by this time, NBC has metrics of, of what tends to play well in prime time. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but from what we're seeing is that social media is spoiling who gets the gold medal, right? Yeah, it's incredibly frustrating because, you know, you, it's impossible to look at Facebook and you don't know, oh, okay, well, the, the first gold medal of the Games was won by an American, that the American women uh, swept uh, a lot of the snowboarding competition that the, you know, Canadian women took, sisters, you know, took the uh, the golds in, uh, in downhill, the new uh, slope style. And that's incredibly frustrating if you want to watch that event, but see, and, and NBC is not going to play it for another five hours. Mm-hmm. And now there's no reasonable way not to find out who the winners are, you know, hours and hours in advance. And yeah. you, I'm not going to turn off Facebook, Twitter, Vine, and yeah. everything else in my entire <laughs> right. digital life, you know, just so I can wait to well, watch the Olympics. Tonight. I, I'm wondering, would it make sense just for NBC to convert itself over? Because we know the Olympics, whether it's summer or winter, it's, it's an advertising gold mine. Of course. So wouldn't it make sense for NBC just to just completely transform their network for these two weeks or however long it is. Is it two weeks? It, it's, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, give or take. Yeah. I think it's to 21. just transform their, their broadcast network and everything into just all Olympics all the time. Because I know even our local NBC affiliates are doing this Olympic Zone broadcast from their newsrooms and they're branding it with the, the corporate thing and they're talking about the local connection of, uh, of, of, of New Orleans or Baton Rouge or wherever you happen to be to Russia, and so they're doing local interest stories, and it's taking the place of some of their um, their 30-minute newscast pieces. And so it seems to me like they've got a really good possibility. So why wouldn't you just convert your network to all Olympic all the time to show everything? I mean, that's right. my question. Well, and given that they have like things like headline news, they could certainly say for the next two weeks, MSNBC is going to pick up the the headline news slack, and, yeah. and HNL is just going to be or HLN is just going to be one hundred percent Olympics. Yeah, I, I I don't know why they wouldn't do that because they, they do that for the Summer Olympics basically, and, and of course, thankfully they uh, thankfully I don't know if that's the word uh, to use, but they also now own what used to be um, uh, I forget which network it was. It was the Versus Channel. Now it's the NBC Sports Network, and so I think right. they've done that on NBA. NBCSN. Yeah, that's that's live. I've been watching. Yeah, it. that's just pretty much a stream. Yeah, and it's awesome. Oh, like, yeah. especially Good. these these weekends. I know it's going to be really bad when I go back to work on Monday, but um, all weekend I've been watching it all day. I stumbled upon it um, mm-hmm. yesterday. Yeah, I had it on while I was working, um, and I didn't get to watch any of the the uh, opening ceremonies mm-hmm. because I was uh, coming back from a uh, pilgrimage with my my parishioners, but supposedly. NBC has even censored out some of the content of that. 
Is that right? Hmm. It, it was it was tragic because it is it is one of the most acid trippy opening ceremonies hmm. I've ever seen in my entire life. Hmm. Uh, it is it is weird. Um, yeah. I mean, in every conceivable way, because you have you have this is very over the top kind of of weird skating moving thing, and then all of a sudden you cut to somebody giving like an hour long speech yeah. uh, over nothing. You know, what I mean, it talked about nothing, and then you cut to to uh, you know some kind of um, a weird ice dancing bear thing, and then you go back to this this group tattoo who are a publicly lesbian group after Putin has said that being gay is Olympic in Soviet Russia. And it just, it's all over the place. Yeah. And NBC, NBC comes in and they cut like one sentence out of the talk, out of the, the speech. And they cut the entire dancing bear thing. And then they cut the entire tattoo song, even though there's nothing in the song that was in any way offensive. And then they're going to, they're going to, it's just, it's so badly done. Um, hmm. maybe, and, maybe we need to and, start and a it's hashtag. It's not even good trimming. It's it just yeah. it's obviously they just cut something out. Yeah, I, f I felt like they were watching it. Even myself, I watched a little bit of it, and I felt like you know it was like oop, commercial time. We don't really know what's going on, so let's just go to commercial. I know. Um, you know, I, I felt like maybe they weren't. <sighs> they really didn't interpret any of it. So at anywhere there was time for a commercial, they stuck one in there well there wasn't <laughs> much interpretation uh true uh, one of the things i heard the um uh, uh, one of the broadcasters mentioned was that that russians believe in dreams and and they're they really focus a lot on their dreams and that's how that what they were doing with this opening uh ceremony was to make it dream like and yeah. it, it was it was it was gorgeous it was beautiful it was um uh, trippy it, tri <laughs> there you go it's a good word for it i i just wonder where where we are if uh, if our country is cutting things out of a, a Russian broadcast, I don't. I mean, we we finished that right in in the nineties, didn't we? Didn't we end all that censoring stuff? I'm just. I mean, I'm just asking the question. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. Um, at Dom Cobb in the chat says, "I heard the technician who missed the opening of the fifth ring in the uh, opening ceremonies was found mysteriously dead." Then there are those sorts <laughs> of things, too. That uh, Siberia. <laughs> okay, but okay, you're watching the Catholic Underground. We promise. Um, so, what is this saying about uh, about about we who are in media, uh, specifically Catholic media here? Um, I I tend to think that if you're going to do something that that really is. Uh, supposed to show the, the beauty of the flourishing of the human spirit, right? The thrill of victory, the agony of defeat. These are very Catholic concepts, right? The, the notion of, yeah. of, of victory, of valor, mm -hmm. of triumph, the notion of, of suffering and, and defeat, and yet still being an Olympian. You get back up and you pick the torch up and you run again. Well, whenever it is kind of hacked and slashed, it takes away from telling some of that story, wouldn't you say? No, it absolutely does, and and it it makes you feel like this is it, it's it's a show, but not a, it's, and there's nothing real about it. There's nothing that's uh, uh, transcendental about it. Yeah. So television actually can have a, a part to play. So uh, so how do we how do we feel about this, Father Ryan? How do you feel about uh, just the the overall uh, Olympic stuff here? Well, I'm I'm embarrassed for us on an international stage with the way it's being handled by NBC, but. I am still very excited about speed skating. I'm very excited about uh, about the downhill the skiing, which has been really interesting so far. Biathlon was fascinating. And, of course, curling. Yes. <laughs> yes. Chess on ice. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, in the chat room, I'm, I'm, I'm taking time to answer this. Uh, Dom Cobb says, the Olympics, true. Not everyone gets a medal for participation. And here's Thank the Catholic Jesus. connection. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall be saved, is what I'm answering. That, I think that's, that's perhaps one of the most important things um, that the Olympics can teach us, is, is striving for excellence. But even whenever we do not excel, we still get up, right? We still get up. Um, I would say that uh, not only do I not have my jetpack or my hoverboard or my Mr. Fusion, and it's 2014, time is running out, people. My Olympics are now being sacrificed at the altar of political correctness, and interstellar copyright law. Klingons don't copyright. Probably Chris Gosh, out. Ah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Kathleen, <laughs> Kathleen, is there any sport that you're looking forward to uh, that you've been following? Uh, well, of course, I am a, a fan of the figure skating. Uh, although, I wish it were a little... I was telling my mom yesterday. I was like, I wish there was some kind of... Um, because I also am looking forward to hockey. I discovered mm -hmm. that today. Oh, yeah? I love it. 
Um, but I wish that Football in figure skating, ice. yeah, I you know I, I got caught up in a in a women's game between Russia and uh, Germany, and it was awesome. Um, and so I kind of wish that I figure skating was a little bit more rough. Like I was telling mom, I you know what happened if like <laughs> to it, check them, yeah, with a toe or pick. like or like there was like a slice of the skate and she was like what well i found that in hockey <laughs> that's right it's <laughs> awesome they're shoving people up against the boards and yeah. if i could if i could handle being on skates i would play that game and and if i think that i could get through a whole game i would watch you doing that it would be yeah. awesome <laughs> i'd be in the penalty box more than i would be on the ice <laughs> but i'm also looking forward to i, I really like um sean white so i'm really looking forward to snowboarding yeah. and um his awesomeness yeah, uh, Father Ryan, you're looking forward, of course, to curling. Yeah, I love curling. But also? Biathlon, actually, mm-hmm. is the event I'm really enjoying, uh, it, uh, it, which seems like a fairly boring thing. It's 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 cross-country skiing combined with precision shooting. Yes. Um, one of, one of my friends in Wyoming does that. And it's it's one of the great endurance events, you know, and it's because it, it's, it's one thing, you know, you go to the first spot, you've only skied about a half mile, you fall down, you pop it, and you're good to go. But when you've been skiing for, like, 20 kilometers yeah and it's cold and your hands are cold and your fingers are not working anymore and you're exhausted and you're like all saying anaerobic five masses in a weekend <laughs> yeah and then, and then you then you fall on the ground in the freaking snow and then you try to knock out a target 60 yards away that's it's it's an incredible endurance skill so i'm really excited that i also enjoy downhill skiing it's just fun and speed skating is fun too yeah i uh, i always enjoy the speed skating and and my heart is in my throat as they make those turns. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm looking forward to the snowboarding as well, um, because I think somewhere way down in, uh, in perhaps one of my calf muscles, I really wish that I had that ability to, to grasp that much adrenaline, but I just don't. So I, I'll just watch other people do it. And then, um, and then I, too, am looking forward to, uh, to curling, because I like, I like that, like that long-form sport. As you say, it's chess on ice. It's well, actually, it's kind of like chess and shuffleboard on ice. <laughs> yeah. It's like a cruise ship to the Antarctic gone mad. <laughs> Let us know what uh, you're looking forward to, or maybe what you looked forward to in the Olympics that uh, that weren't covered. Backchat at CatholicUnderground.com is the way to do it. You're listening to the Catholic Underground. We are online at catholicunderground.tv. You can check our show notes and picks of the week there. Our picks of the week are, in fact, coming up a little bit later. But first, I'm Father Chris Decker. Father Ryan Humphreys is in his rectory. Jeff Blackwell is in the technical director suite. Kathleen Lee is eminently to my side. Here I am. And, uh, and then Mary-Kate Taylor is in the, uh, the video cave, making sure that everything runs smoothly. She's like her own NBC production truck. <laughs> in one person she's got all of the controls right there and uh and of course we're coming to you free and unfettered certainly uncensored because well jeff doesn't have a bleeper thing all we have is bat for kathleen every like now and again my hockey game that's right <laughs> yeah it takes me back to the ice <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's the penalty box yeah. right there that's what it is uh, oh yeah. my goodness well <laughs> I don't know what to say. Um, in somewhat controversial news, a new and rigorous study uh, found that up to 70% of teens with a, a so-called gay attraction later say that they are exclusively heterosexual. Now, this is pretty groundbreaking, especially in our current social and cultural milieu, isn't it, Father? It is. It's, it's become kind of a, of a dogma um, in the counseling kind of world, not in the counseling world, but in the, in the secular world that, you know, uh, it... People, are, if anyone is 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 gay or has same sex attraction, that we can't ask any questions about that. We simply have to assume that they are born that way, a la Lady Gaga, and leave the question alone. Yeah. Um, but the but within the counseling world, people who do actually interact with real people, we we have the notion that people go through phases, and teenagers go through more phases than most people, um, or than 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 adult people. Uh, and there's nothing controversial about that. Phases are phases. Right. Um. And so one of the things that these researchers started doing, these are researchers at Cornell, said, let's look at those phases and see if there's any overlap with the question of same-sex attraction. And they did a a very, very rigorous study uh, with four waves of students from the early 90s until 2008. And their overwhelming results found that the vast majority of young men and women 
who experience some kind of same-sex attraction as teenagers, uh -huh. whether it's exclusive or not, will later experience that merely as a phase in psychosexual development and then will grow out of it and become ordinary heterosexual uh, men and women down the road. And the researchers are careful to note this is not about people who went to counseling uh, to be ungayed or went to a degaying camp or something like this. It's yeah. just natural phases, basically saying it's not unusual for a young man or woman to experience same-sex attraction as a teenager and then for that simply to to go away the same way that any other kind of teenage phase would pass. So do you suppose that that maybe what's happening uh, in, in our society today, though, is, is a kind of a way, whether it's the media or whether it's just the trajectory of psychological uh, circles, uh, to, to kind of keep young people, especially because we see that our young people are being targeted here right. in, in, in every form of media. Is it a way to kind of keep them in that state of arrested development and, and not to begin to maybe question further, okay, is there something outside of what society is telling me I am if I have this attraction? Well, I think all, going all the way back to, to John Dewey, who was kind of the foundation of our modern educational system, he said, education is a tool to change culture. And so kids are nothing more than cogs in our efforts to change culture. And I see this as, as just a, are, are the people who try to say, if you're a teenager and you're gay, you have to come out with it. You have to own it. And you have to be as public about it as you possibly can be as people who are just trying to bring about their own ends in culture and they're using children mm -hmm. for their end. And, and those people I could never have any respect for, people who, who are going to use kids for their own ends. That's just not right. Well, sure. That's, that's the same vein of, uh, of what we've been struggling with in, in the Catholic Church and, and the society's view of the Catholic Church overarching now uh, of, of those who, who abuse children and, and use them for their own end, right? And right. yet the society perhaps in which we live is not holding up a mirror saying, okay, there is something disordered about, about those who would use advertising, who would use uh, even, um, even counseling and, and the psychological profession to, to, to push this agenda of, of who knows where it's going or why. But it seems to me like there's, there's a disconnect there. Well, I mean, and, and it's it's fairly easy to see if I can, you know, what, what does a drug dealer do, do? He gives you a little taste of his product until you get hooked, yeah. and then you've got to have it. And so what are we doing with our teenagers? We're encouraging their their inability to control themselves, and we're saying have all the sex you can handle, um, you know, get, get extremely addicted to that kind of constant sexual release, and then we're going to put that on TV, we're going to put it in movies, we're going to put it in music, so that once you become completely and totally unable to control your libido at any level, yeah. all during your life, you're going to be forced to come back and watch more and watch more and watch more. It's basically an addictive form of softcore pornography. Mm -hmm. um, and and the homosexual agenda is part of that equation. Yeah. Um, not, not all people who experience same sexual attraction, but right. those people who are really pushing that agenda, who are saying, this is the dogma of the new gay subculture and you will believe it. Nobody's allowed to disagree with us. Yeah. And that's why I think these people at Cornell are brave people because this is the kind of study that needs to be shown. It's 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 not unusual for a young man or young woman to experience a disordered attraction of any kind because yeah. there's they're, they're basically walking hormones in tennis yeah. shoes. That's right. And uh you know and 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 when you come to the other side of puberty, you you have learned by definition how to deal with all that you know that stuff in you and you've got some grip on your ability to control yourself yeah. unless you've given into the aber zombie culture right in which case you have become basically an addict to that constant stream of 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 orgasm and and, and pornography and sexuality and sexualization right. and you're unable then to control yourself so you've got to immediately go back and, and get get in that that addictive cycle and of course this is there there is real spiritual battle that that accompanies this as well um, you know, uh, in the in the chat room, uh, Taylor uh, says, surprisingly, quote, being gay, unquote, is almost a trend right now among teenagers. It's a way to get attention and rebel against parents, and it's also popular. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathleen, d in your work with youth, do you see any of that? Yeah, I think that there, there's teenagers are, and I remember being one myself, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's just a time of... Wasn't that long for us, Kathleen? It we wasn't. were teenagers not too long ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's a time of, of confusion and just 
trying to fit in and not knowing where I know, a, a, you know, I went to an all girls school. I know several girls in high school who were, um, who experienced same sex attraction. Yes. And then, um, later on got married mm-hmm. to men, you know, mm-hmm. and it's, it, it was, it's just interesting to see this research because it hap- it's happened. Right. I've seen it and, you know, um, and yeah, you know, I, I always tend to just f- feel bad for teenagers because they just, it, it's a time of, I don't know what's going on and, yeah. you know, what can, what can I do to, you know, really get back at my parents, like you were saying, or just to stick out and be that individual. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I've seen it happen. And it's interesting to see this, this, uh, these studies back it up yeah one of the things that that kind of gives me a little bit of, of comfort in this is that it, it holds up the reality of of phases within development I mean that's that's something that's that's we know that especially of, of young children they go through phases they they have phases in which they have an imaginary friend they go through phases in which they want the puppy they the these are natural parts of development and then of course father, um, you, as you say, you, you get to a point where, where you have hormones just rushing through your body that, in most cases, even your face is not prepared for because it starts breaking out all over the place, you know? And and if that's what's happening in your face, imagine what's happening <laughs> in your brain, and your heart, you know? Yeah. And and so it's important to say, as we do, that, that there, is a, there is a spiritual component to all of this to realize that, uh, that, that Satan is, is trying to get us to a place of pure apathy and... And that is really what addiction can do, is, as you say, it can move us into this cycle where we don't know any way out other than the, the, the place, other than the cycle that we're in. And, and that is when, that is when we, we can see perhaps people that, that they lose faith. And, and we know that those who's ex- who experience same-sex attraction sometimes will turn their back on the church, mm-hmm. even though the church, if you would just go to a priest, the priest would say, no, please come, don't. Yeah. Don't don't stay away. Come to the sacraments. We, this is what we, of course, we will ask of you morally because we believe that you were created good. Uh, but some don't even give the church a chance because they think that if they're caught in this cycle or the beginning of this cycle, society has already judged the church as as unwilling. Right. Right. Yeah. And, when and society so, has has also said that it is impossible in in any reasonable way. Yeah. To be chaste, right, and certainly it's impossible to be celibate. Yeah, and so the idea is, if I go to the priest, what is he going to tell me? Is he going to tell me something I don't want to hear? Better just not to go at all. Right, right, yeah. Um, connected to um, to this in the chat room, Lauren Paparaki says uh, it's not just rebellion. Teens want to be part of something bigger than themselves, and they want to be part of movements. And the gay culture is yeah. a current hot movement right now. And it's interesting to note that uh, those who, who I have known who have experienced same-sex attraction, when they get involved in, in, in something like a, a youth movement, uh, like, a, like a, a Catholic youth movement, oftentimes they'll begin to, to see in, in this bigger movement of, of Catholic youth something that gives them identity. Mm-hmm. And, and as I often tell those who struggle with same-sex attraction, uh, your sexual orientation is not your identity. It is a component of your identity, and it is one that must continually be examined, but it's not your identity. Your actual personhood and your baptism are your identity. And, and so it's interesting, as you say, to, to, to kind of get involved in something like that um, can really be helpful. I found it helpful for, for those. And again, this is not kind of the, the decaying camp or go to this youth event and all of a sudden you'll experience mm-hmm. right attraction. No. I'm talking about being able to say, look, there's there's a component here that you may be putting a lot more stock in because the world is. Uh, how about we introduce the Lord into the mix and and let Him let Him teach you uh, in the Eucharist, let Him teach you in um, in the relationships that you build with one another with with your fellow youth, mm-hmm. and and allow that to do do the work too. Um, I, I don't know. It's it's the church does have a lot to speak about this, right, Father? We, the church really does. Really, it really does. It's, we yeah. think in the society that it doesn't, because that's what the society says. Is the church just says no, gay bad, so stay away. Right. Right. And and frankly, that dogmatic way of seeing things, you know, is the, the church is never going to be able to find her place within that kind of a dogma. But the big takeaway from from this entire study and from all of these kind of discussions, and and from all the discussions we're going to have in the future, ultimately is that parents and teachers ought to treat their children 
with kindness, but yeah. also with firmness. Yes. Um, and that no one should be given favored victim status yeah. uh, or let off the hook for, with moral expectations. Everybody should be called to be a saint, and every parent should have a genuine interest in seeing that their child experiences love and nurturing, yeah. but also that they experience the challenge of the universal call to holiness and the true weight of the Christian message, which is joy comes with the morning, but you got to pick up your cross and follow after him. Right. And those two are tied together. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true. Uh, Jeff, any thoughts as we, as we work our way through this, uh, phases are difficult for everybody. They are. I'm confused. <laughs> so, and Is that the, a uh, pimple, Jeff, on uh, your forehead? No, kidding, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, no I, we, uh, you know, my, our kids are, 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 are all grown, grown and gone, uh, but, uh, uh, but it's been a long time, but I can still see my, my granddaughter is yeah. 17 years old and um, wants to, you know, wants to, to gravitate to the things that are popular. Yeah. So I, I can understand. And that's uh, a normal that, thing. That yeah. It yeah. is. Uh, as uh, Taylor says in the chat, it really doesn't help that it's becoming popular among celebrities. And it's also practically in every TV show and every movie. Mm-hmm. And and that is, Father, I think where um, if if you say if the family unit is structured, if it's ordered properly and if it's functioning then there's more of a chance to, to actually get through to your children, even if they are experiencing same-sex attraction, to be able to offer them nurture, to be able to offer them love, and to be able to offer them boundary. That, perhaps, is what can kind of help a discernment of the phase, right? Yeah, if, if a strong family unit means that the child is able to identify uh, you know, themselves within that family unit for a, a, a long time, yep. and therefore they don't feel like they have to go somewhere else to, to get a sense of personal identity. Right. And so what does uh, all of this data ultimately mean for those with same-sex attractions and the church? Well, I, as I said before, I mean, it, it, it means that everybody has a home in the church, and everyone always will have a home in the church. Yeah. But at the same time, nobody should ever consider themselves able to simply be off the hook. Yeah. Uh, by whether they actually have same-sex attraction or whether they uh, simply would like to to be a, a minor celebrity for a little while, you know, because of favored victim status. Yeah, and and that of course is is the important thing to to underscore again is that there was there is there always will be a home for everyone in the Catholic Church. If you're suffering, well, <laughs> we are a church of sufferers, huh? If if you are in a place of sin. We are a church of sinners, and we are called to confess the sins, right? We are called to, to make ourselves right with God. We are called to be in community. And if there's one thing that Satan wants to do for any of us, uh, whatever the, the sexual attraction or orientation or, or struggle, he always wants to isolate us. And it's interesting that he's using this movement within our society that's disordered that seems like a community, but it's actually just creating a community of people who are isolated one from another. And, and so there will always be a place for you in the church. If you're struggling right now, if you're watching Catholic Underground, uh, know that there is a place for you. Know that there's a place for you. And, um, and perhaps uh, speak to, to someone that you trust in your parish. Uh, perhaps if, uh, if you're, you're um, in a, a good relationship maybe with your priest, don't be afraid. Um, because there are those who want to talk with you. There are those who actually want to minister to you uh, in a way that can show you that you're not alone. And so... Uh, we offer that uh, for you here at the Catholic Underground and know, of course, that we pray for everybody who is struggling with one cross or another because, well, that's part of what we do. See you from the Catholic Underground. You know, ministry isn't easy, and uh, the transition from a fully in-person church to a both-and-online evangelization tends to fail more than it succeeds, especially on the parish level, and uh, Catholic Tech Talk as uh, they often have done, uh, they want to tell you why your parish online stuff isn't working. And so, the number one answer is uh, you have no clear reason for using social media. <laughs> that's, that's the number one answer on the board. Um, I, I often wonder about this. In fact, with my own parish, um, should I be using social media? Uh, it seems to me that, that most parishes don't really have a clear vision or reason for doing so, right, Father? I, 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 I struggle myself, other than announcements, of trying to find a reason for for using social media. Yeah, I mean, when I when I first got to the the parish I was in uh, before in in Campty, out in the small little parish, 
I immediately set up all these social media identities, I mean, LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter and, and Instagram. I had no idea why, just they were there, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, and within about the past, or within about the first five or six months, I, I was posting all kinds of random different things. None of them were getting any traction. Yeah. And uh, I, I really could not sit down and say, this is the purpose mm -hmm. of this website. It just was, well, it's there. Why not use it? Right. And that's what I think drives a lot of uh, maybe a pastor who doesn't know anything about the internets. And he, he says to his youth minister, usually, uh, or maybe the secretary, we need to have one of them web page things, you know, we need to be on that Facebook or the tweets and, and, and yeah, the, it seems to me though, that, um, that there are, there are wrong reasons, there are right reasons. And, and so many folks kind of embrace those wrong reasons for, for using social media in their parish. Um, as I say, the reason that I tend to use social media, and I'm not saying it's a right one is just to repeat what's being said in the bulletin. Um, it's kind of, I guess, Father, the uh, the fire hose, you know? Right. We, right. We, if you're not reading the bulletin, well, then let me give it to you on the Facebook feed. If you're not reading the Facebook feed, let me give it to you Twitter. If it's not working on Twitter, then hopefully you're subscribed to the Flock Note feed. And so you end up basically just retyping your bulletin to copy and paste thing uh, all week long. Um, and then, of course, Kathleen, uh, one of the wrong reasons is to reach the kids. To reach the kids, yeah. And I don't know. Uh, with the with the exception of trying to go where they are, mm -hmm. um, is this a good reason to have a parish website? I've had a lot of friends who are youth ministers be really successful in uh, in using social media. Facebook, mm -hmm. you know, don't forget we had this event. Um, you know, a lot of it too is is sharing what's going on in the youth group. If you post the article to the website or you post the article to the to the parish um, Facebook feed about something that the youth group did that weekend. Um, it's a little bit more accessible. It's a little bit more, you know, in your face kind mm -hmm. of this, this is what's going on. I mean, that's been successful. Now, again, you know, with talking about kids and, and social media and, um, you know, especially with a position and not just a parish, yeah. um, like say a youth minister, there's all kinds of different, you know, child safety things you want that you have to kind of deal with. And so yeah. done in the right way, I think it could be very successful and it has been um, to reach the kids, but, um, but more from like a youth ministry perspective, not, I haven't really seen it done well from a parish. Yeah. You know, I, I, I like to, to subscribe to parishes that I know that things are going on around me. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I'm, I'm older and I'm, I'm old. Yeah, you know? exactly. Isn't that something we are old now? I yeah. Know. Another wrong reason is to appear to be in the know. You know, just to to kind of say, hey, we know what we're talking about. Now, there are some right reasons, Father. Um, and, and one of the, the very basic things, really the only reason my parish website exists right now is the static info, right? Contact yeah, and, info. And there, there's room for, for static info, provided that you say my online website yeah. is there to provide some static info. So you have your contact info, you have your location, you have your bulletin or some information like that. Uh, and, and that's an okay reason, but... If, and if that's all you want to accomplish right. and you're not spending $7,000 a year from some obnoxiously expensive company, then that's fine. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, you kind of want to even go further and say that the, the primary reason under that static info is interaction. You yeah. want people to come to that website and get information and then have a call to action. Yes. You want them mm -hmm. to, to see that and say, oh, I need to go visit St. James. Mm -hmm. Oh, I need to be a part of St. Philip. Oh, I need to go do a tour of something. Yeah. Um, you know, because there should be a sense of interaction either in real life or on that website. That That is the one of the first and best reasons to have an online presence, whether it's website or social media. Yeah. Uh, and number two would be to, to direct personal growth, to, to move us from interaction in, within the community uh, but also then to to invite us to to reflect, right? So uh, whether that's an article, uh, whether it's a maybe something other than the pastor's article in the bulletin, mm -hmm. uh, and then maybe blog and book recommendations. Uh, I know, Father, you do some of that on your website now. Is that right? We do some of it on the website, but that's really what we're doing with social media. And uh -huh. uh, in fact, I posted on my school's Facebook page not long ago. Um, an article about um, about lust and what lust is, and a parent, you know, fired back very quickly and said, "This is inappropriate mm -hmm. uh, for a face for a Facebook page for a school." And I said, 
Well, it's not for these reasons. And I explained that Facebook is limited to those 13 and older. Facebook yeah. is uh, is there to not to provide information so much as it is to be uh, a we're trying to help parents parent, yeah. um, you know, and things like that. And, and I explained in, in a very kind of clear way what the purpose of our Facebook page was. And the parent was a little taken aback and he said, well, that, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> it's not just randomly there to post you know, pictures and, um, and, and just kind of make statements into the ether, but that there's real value. And, and part of it is interaction and part of it is to direct the personal growth of our parents, just as the, the Minor Basilica's Facebook page shares articles and recommendations for books to direct the personal growth of my parishioners. That's right. Uh, Lauren Paprocki in the uh, chat says, in 10 years, expect all parishioners to be internet savvy along with whatever replaces the current social media. There could be some truth to that. The, it's in, there, there are almost always going to be young people who aren't, though. Yeah. I mean, there, there are people that are my age or younger that still uh, the, the, the dread machine scares them. Mm-hmm. Well, and I, I would disagree with that on a different level. I don't think that social media in the sense that the broadcast sense, mm-hmm. that you know, Facebook is, is the fire hose. It's wide open. Um, and and you just have this huge amount of information, and you know what? None of the kids want anything to do with it. They all want Instagram, which is much much tighter network. But really, beyond that, they want Snapchat. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Not just to send naked pictures themselves, but because they want to they want to have a direct personal connection that is in no way part of the part of the main. Uh, yeah, it's one to one. It's one to one. They don't they don't want the broadcast. And when I ask my kids at school. Um, you know, what the story is with social media, none of them want Facebook. A very, very small want, few want Twitter, mostly just to follow celebrities. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the rest of them, like Vine and YouTube, is the only broadcast method they want. Because it's entertainment, um, right? It's, it's right. Like large form entertainment. Yeah, and I mean, beyond that, though, they like the new feature of Instagram, which allows direct messaging. Mm-hmm. And they like Snapchat. And they, and they like Path, some of them do. Uh, the more social, more uh, savvy of them, but they don't want the 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 broadcast mentality anymore. And so Facebook is becoming not about the kids, but ninety nine percent of it is that middle age crowd. Wow, yeah, there you go. And then of course number three is to reduce pressure on those considering becoming Catholic or returning to the faith. Uh, as we say with Catholic Radio and even the Catholic Underground, you can listen anonymously and get the information that you need. Uh, that's that's a, a good yeah. reason uh, to use to use social media. Uh, um, and I think that we we we're doing that a little bit uh, with uh, with Catholic Underground. Certainly, the Minor Basilica is doing that. Uh, the number two answer to why your parish online stuff isn't working: <gasps> you're setting the wrong goals. Um, the goals that are usually set, either consciously by a parish counselor or web team, or unconsciously, is to increase attendance at mass, to increase or gain online contributions, to build up community, which means uh, something different to everybody on the planet. And uh, maybe to evangelize, which also means something different to everybody on the planet. Um, and so there are some right goals, perhaps, uh, from, uh, from the, the church, the Catholic Tech Talk. Um, right goals might be, number one, what, uh, to, uh, to find something that's practical, right? Something that's, that can be done. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, any goal needs to be practical, concrete, and achievable. And I know we're we're running a little uh, long tonight, so indeed, um, it's okay. Those, uh, Keep going. So, so the the right goals for your social media, which is a little different than the right reasons for having one. Number one, you need to provide a set of tools for your parishioners. They need to be able to come to the website or the social media presence as part of their personal mission to evangelize. <clears throat> Um, that means articles, infographics, online resources. It means clear and attractive yes. static info so that they can be confident in sending other people to see that. If you've got some ungodly Comic Sans thing that no. links to a PDF file, I can't send anybody to your site. How could I no. possibly introduce you to the manager? You That's, can't. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and so so there's that. Second, you want to reduce the barrier of entry for somebody who is not a parishioner but may be interested in your parish or in the faith overall. That mm-hmm. should be a goal of every parish system of online media that we have. That's where the broadcasting can be useful, right? Very much. Yeah. Very much. Uh, the, the third goal, you can reduce the barrier of entry for somebody who may be intimidated by a personal encounter with a priest or even a member of the staff. Uh, and that that goes back to that that notion of reducing pressure from someone who might be want to become Catholic. Um, 
And then finally, there's, if, if there are online contributions, what you want to do is, is as a goal, pitch that as a way to be seen as a benefit to the parishioner. Mm-hmm. not just to the parish. So, you know, what about a little postcard or a little receipt that they could put in an envelope? So you want to, you want to say, this is something that, that is, is it here to help you? Um, and the goals can, they could, they, these aren't the only acceptable goals, but I mean, you want to set goals that really are affiliated with what your parish is trying to accomplish. These goals are specific to the minor basilica that, cause I wrote them, yeah. but, but these, you know, your goals need to be oriented toward, what is my audience and how is it that I'm going to communicate with? Exactly. Yeah. And, and I, I think that leads us to the, the, the third version there, right? Um, the reason your, your parish online stuff isn't working, audience, 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 you're not taking advantage of the audience that you have. You're not, uh, I guess the, the word that we could use is you're not marketing to them properly, right? Yeah. And, and we could, we've talked about this before and we could go on and on and on. Sure. What's, What's been wrong is that we tend to think about social media as syndication. Like you said, Father, I've got yeah. the bulletin, and so my email bulletin is the same thing, and my website is basically the same thing, and my pulpit announcements are basically the same thing, and my Facebook is basically the same thing, and my Twitter is basically the same thing, instead of realizing that each of those is its entirely own animal, you know, and just by way of a, of a quick kind of, you know, de- explanation of that. And the bulletin you might have a wordy write-up for an event. But from the pulpit, you have an impassioned plea, maybe a little yeah. guilt. On the website, you have a full write-up with pictures and links. In the email bulletin, you're going to have a shorter write-up with a pic and a link or two. On Facebook, you're going to have a pixel graphic, 500 by 500 you know, pixel graphic slate that can be shared and that you're going to call to action with. But then on Twitter, you're going to have just a, a, several tweets with clever titles and some hashtags. I mean, and this is the plan for when Father Z comes to my parish next month. Yeah, you're you know, going to cover it, basically. Yeah, but we're, but every every site, every system is its entirely its own different animal. Yeah. And so it's not just syndicating. Each of them is a different strategy and requires an entirely different approach because the audience for Twitter and the Bulletin could not be more different. Right. And and we see that in, in how they receive information and then just jettison what they what they don't understand or, or what they don't need, right? They're, it's all about uh, tailoring the broadcast, basically uh, based upon the tool that you're using. Yeah, that's um, and that and that takes a team, doesn't it, Father? I mean, it takes people that are on on top of it. It, it usually does. I mean, I'm doing it on my own, um, but I'm kind of the exception to the rule because this is stuff yeah. I do so often you that can it, it suspend, comes very easily. Yeah, you can suspend all these solutions in your brain at the same time. I can't. Right, <laughs> but but for most people. The person who who works on the bulletin, the priest who who does the pulpit announcement, and the people who do Facebook and Twitter are going to be different people. Yeah. Um, and and frankly, if you're going to be any good at it, you need to have that. And especially if you're going to go samurai and you're going to go to full on advanced level and start doing YouTube and Vine. Yeah, you you're going to need people who have special skills in that area. Yeah. Otherwise, don't come to the hockey rank. You know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay, well, um, if you have anything that you'd like to offer, do so at backchat at catholicunderground.com. You can also comment on our Facebook page for this episode. You can find that at facebook.com slash catholicunderground. But first, of course, we must go because time is quickly flying to... Veg goes. The CU Pick of the Week. All right, now for our CU Pick of the Week, uh, let's go over to Kathleen because you have a real... You have the Holy Father's Pick of the Week. I do. You pick know, of the papacy. And maybe. I... Um, I love the pope and so pretty much what he says i do oh. um and he ha- like he's like i think this is a really good idea yes yes it is <laughs> um so i i stumbled across this i did not know this until probably a, a week or two ago um this uh mary undoer of knots can you see yeah whoa, yeah if you're watching whoa, on the video feed whoa, there. if you're watching on the video feed um it's actually a novena that um our holy father pope francis is is spreading he says this yeah is, he prays it himself right? yes he he has a devotion to it himself um and he is saying listen the good stuff so it's a pretty cool novena um it's an it's a nine-day novena um and it, you know when i'm looking at it, i'm th- it has this beautiful if for those of you who can see if you if you aren't are you listening to this later you should look up the image it's beautiful of our lady um and she has this this what's a a wedding ribbon and she's undoing these knots you know just uh-huh. mm, 
she looks so serene. Right. And like I, f- I think that's kind of what we as Catholics sometimes need to rely on. You mm-hmm. know, we have this crazy life that we're just like, oh, this isn't going right. And, and I've got to fix it. Yeah. yeah. And, and all we have to do is say, Mary, like, I can't do it. You do it. Help me. I need That's some right. help. Intercede, and she just goes to work. Yeah, and so in, so what I found what was beautiful about this was it gives you um, nine days, of course, and then nine things to pray for each day. Ooh. And so it talks about the first day, um, those struggling with marriages, um, second with addictions, um, third for your pastor, fourth mm. for your bishop, um, fifth for the poor, sixth for the unbelieving, um, seventh for Christians outside the Catholic Church. Um, the eighth day for the Holy Father, and then only on the ninth day, only on the ninth day, you pray for your own needs, which I thought, wow, that's awesome. You yeah. pray for all these things before you pray for your own. So, so it's a novena, really, of humility, right? Yes, of saying mm-hmm. that that my prayer should first of all be sure. uh, for those who who have issues that are not my own. Mm-hmm. I should pray for other people's knots before, which are huge, yeah, compared to my tiny ones. Wow. So. I'm very excited to start this. I, I'm. I haven't. I need to. Re, I'm still reading on it. Yeah. So because I want to understand it before I start it, but I will be starting it this week. Very interesting, Mary Undoer of Knots. Mm-hmm. Um, let's go over to to Jeff, who's knotted up in the control room there. <laughs> oh uh, well, I'm glad to be here though. Uh, <laughs> mine is a really um, uh, cool. My daughter, uh, who has a teenager. Yes. Uh, told me about this one, Flipagram. Uh, it was new to me, and I even asked Father Chris, and he said he had not heard of it. But um, this is not uncommon. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it'll be in the show notes at uh, CatholicUnderground.com. It's an easy to use app. Uh, it's a it puts together a simple little slideshow, um, and um, it allows you to uh, you can add as many pictures to you as you want. There's ex- some examples on their oh. website where it, I mean it's real real fast. Oh. Or you can space them out over the course of time. You can put your own music to it. You can narrate uh, the slideshow. And uh, let me see. There was something else. Oh, yeah, they have uh, some some, gra- some graphics. Very, very simple graphics. It's like a line of graphics if you want to put in a title. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, And if you want to, to add $2 more and, and, and purchase the pro version, uh, you can even put your own personalized watermark on it. So it's, it's a cool little That's way cool. To, to email uh, a short little slideshow of like huh. 15, 30 seconds in length with a bunch of pictures in it. So, flip That's a grant. That's awesome. Very neat. Uh, Father Ryan. So, I'm recommending Simple.com. It's an online bank. Online banking is scary. The idea of giving people your money and hoping they do something with it. Um, it's an it's an excellent, excellent online bank. It's a fully real licensed bank. Uh, and it's the only bank I use, actually, for my money. It has a great system of... Uh, what they call goals, which amount to the old envelope method of you put a dollar in a day kind of thing yeah. or two dollars a day and you pay your bills that way. Um, and, and overall, it's just been a great experience. I, I had an overdraft with them because the IRS accidentally pulled out double the amount I authorized. Oh. And uh, and it was a big, scary thing. And I called them and they said, oh, don't worry about that. The IRS, we, we can't stand those people. And uh, and so they said <laughs> so they, they charged me nothing because it wasn't my fault. Um and and sent me you know they've just been incredibly great in experience and so simple dot com and if anybody needs a, uh, a, invite. a what are they an invite I have about eight or nine left and you can email Catholic Underground and just uh, put R E me and I'll uh, I'll give you one I'm a simple user you're a simple man <laughs> <laughs> yeah we know uh, my uh, my pick of the week is actually a book that I found. While uh, I was on pilgrimage with my my parish, we went to Alabama, Alabama, to uh, to the EWTN studios, and to uh, to Hansville, Alabama, or, well, also in Alabama, and to Hansville to the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament. And I got to tell you, I'm really amazed at how they have made EWTN itself in Irondale uh, a wonderful place of retreat. Um, you you think, well, gee, this is where EWTN is. There's just a big studio there. But whenever the sisters uh, vacated it and moved to the shrine, to the, the, the monastery of Our Lady of the Angels at the shrine in Hansville, the friars uh, of the, the Eternal Word took over. So the Franciscan friars of the Eternal Word took over and they made it into their friary. And they have the chapel there, which is where the daily mass is broadcast from. And so pilgrims can come. And uh, they can uh, they can visit the gift shop, of course, because what Catholic pilgrimage site is complete without a gift shop? Really good gift shop. 
And then, of course, uh, we also, uh, there's the chapel. We went to Mass. And then because there are the friars there, uh, the priests would come and they would give us spiritual talks throughout the day. And mm-hmm. the very last thing is the tour of the network. And so it's not like, hey, come and see this big commercial enterprise, but it's come see what the Lord is doing in your life and your heart. Mm-hmm. And, oh, by the way, this is the network that uh, that our Lord has built. Mm-hmm. I, I was really uh, enamored of it. But in the gift shop, there's a really good book called The Pope and the CEO. It's by Andreas Widmer. He was a Swiss guard. This, uh, in fact, uh, if you're watching us on the video feed, you can kind of see he was a, a young, strapping 20-year-old, or I think he maybe entered at 18 or, or 19. He grew up uh, to be a CEO, and uh, he rediscovered everything that Pope John Paul II taught him by his actions and by the occasional little meetings that he had with the Swiss Guard uh, about being a good businessman. And it's a quick read. I'm almost uh, halfway through it, but just what I'm on right now, I'm on the section on prayer. And, uh, and he'll, he intersperses things that happened while he was a Swiss guard, what the Pope, uh, how the Pope impacted that, and then how it, it's found application in his life today, and then how it can find application in yours. And so that's my pick of the week. The Pope and the CEO will have a link to that in our show notes. Really, really good, very good book. Mm-hmm. All right. My goodness. So, Jeff Blackwell, we thank those who, uh, who help us. Indeed we do, and portions of the Catholic Underground are brought to you by... AudibleTrial.com slash Catholic Underground. That's AudibleTrial.com slash Catholic Underground. That's right. And we also thank all of you who are benefactors to us. Uh, with your prayer, you have kept us on the air, and you've even increased our air uh, air capacity, if you will, since 2006. Uh, Jeff, did you know we've been on the air since 2006? Yes, I, I read the story. Yeah, and, uh, and, and quite a story it is. And it's amazing what the Lord has been able to do, not just through... You and I, um, sitting here, but but through you who who are listening to us, who are watching us, who are um, taking us along with you on your car trip, taking us along with you in your ear holes as you run. I don't know if anybody would actually run to the Catholic Underground. I can't, I breathe too hard when I run. We'd have to talk louder. I don't know. Or, or, or we'd have to talk with better cadence. I'm not sure. Uh, if you want to find the show notes that accompany our episode in the podcast, you can find out more about us at catholicunderground.com. You can also find out how to get us on uh, Facebook and Twitter and maybe Instagram. Father Ryan's church is online at minorbasilica.org. He's at FR Humphreys on Twitter. Thank you, Father Ryan. It's been my pleasure, Father. Now in video. How does it feel to be on video, Father? It feels great. <laughs> <laughs> he loves lamp. Also, uh, Jeff Blackwell, he's the tech director for the CU. He's the ruling despot at Blackwell Communications Group, jeffblackwell.us, and Jeff Blackwell is on Twitter. Hey, Jeff, thank you. It's a pleasure, Father. We've also got Kathleen Lee. She is our faith ninja at Kathleen Y-A-B-R. Thank you, Kathleen. Anytime. And uh, and Mary-Kate Taylor is an evangelist. In her spare time, she's an official ambassador to Boogie Town. Yeah, she is. And you know me. I'm Father Chris Decker. You can follow me on Twitter at Digital Catholic. Join us on the interwebs for catholicunderground.tv for even more from the CU. Thanks for tuning in and hanging out with us here on the digital continent. We're Catholic Underground, we're Faith Gone Digital, and we will see you next time. From the Catholic Underground.